Um, well, thank you for joining everybody. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm an application engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. Um, and today, uh, me and a colleague, Jesse Howarth, are going to be talking about um, 3D screening and printing um, and what it means to rap revolutionize rapid prototyping. Um, and you know, this is kind of a pretty big topic when it comes to uh, working with 3D scanners and printers, just the idea of rapid prototyping. So we're hoping throughout this webinar to kind of shine a light on some methods of modeling um, and some methods on approaching the print itself. Um, so that way you can kind of get the best product out as fast as possible. So as for our agenda, um, I'm going to do a brief little introduction on the topic, um, just talking a little bit about the idea of the 3D printing and scanning um, and how they work together. Um, I'm going to dive into the idea of design intent. This is um, what it comes into kind of fine tuning a scan to get the best print out of it. And then some alternative methods of designing so that way you can create different forms of rapid prototyping um, models. And then after all of that, um, Jesse's going to come in. He's going to talk about the printer side of it. He's going to talk about different printers that can be used for 3D printing, um, kind of the methods that come into uh, printing itself um, and how you can kind of go uh, and maximize the amount of objects in your print bed or optimize the print itself. We're gonna have a little Q&A at the end, um, but you are more than welcome to ask questions throughout it um, and we'll see those pop up. Uh, this is a series of, this is actually the third webinar in a series of webinars, um, and we have one more coming up next week. It's going to be called Scanning to its Full Potential, um, Simulation and Marketing. And the idea behind this last webinar is going to be um, just for the unknown and kind of lesser known parts of 3D scanners, um, the, the idea of using it for renders and marketing and possibly even for simulation. So it's a really cool um, closing topic. So as for our webinar, kind of jumping into it a bit more, um, I want to talk about uh, initially why we really can't go um, from a scan right to a print. Because um, a lot of times this is a pretty common question that's asked is, hey, can I 3D scan something and then send it to my printer? And yes, you actually can. Um, it's totally possible because you are working with a mesh. However, um, this can be an issue if you're trying to 3D print like a mechanical part. And the reason why is because scanners um, will make a little bit of computer assumptions, but also most of our parts have wear and tear to them um, or just parts that are hard to scan itself. So for example, um, I have this kind of guitar fret or uh, this, this guitar board on the bottom and you know spots that had shiny little areas are adding these little bumps. And if we were to send this right from a scan to a print, um, we would have these tiny little bumps and probably not intended to have those in our actual print. Um, as it comes to mechanical parts, um, this is an issue when it comes to hole filling um, and so on. Again, we have natural wear and tear on a lot of our parts, um, maybe some improper fittings, something that happened during the actual manufacturing side of it. So what we like to do is before we send it to our printer, we want to add a little bit of engineering to it so we can take those holes that are not the proper size um, in these locations that might not be exact and actually add in proper dimensions to them and proper fittings and so on and so on. So that way when we do send it to our printer or export it out as an STL, um, we get again that, that perfect print um, and everything is the way we want. Um, and how this can kind of tie into the idea of rapid prototyping is, you know, we don't want to send something to a printer and then it turns out to be wrong right off the bat. Uh, we want to make sure that we have some kind of smart information to it so we can adjust it later on. So I keep adding the, or I keep mentioning this term design intent and what is it actually referring to? Um, well, there's actually two versions of design intent. Um, it's a, it's a, or two terms for it. One is how is this part intended to be made and how is it intended to be altered? So we're probably used to design intent in the form of that latter one, where if we're working in something like SolidWorks, if I add in a fillet and then maybe change my face, how does the face changing or the part changing affect that fillet? Is it going to adjust the way that I want? Well, when it comes to 3D scanning, um, our idea of design intent is, is this actually the way it was meant to be made? Um, so because we're starting to work now a lot more with additive manufacturing and 3D printing, and we're kind of moving away from the idea of like like a CNC mills and so on. Well, I mean, not fully away, but you know, moving more into something more precise. Um, you know, we're getting rid of that kind of question of how is this intended to be made um, in the manufacturing process and in the and putting it more into the design side. So. In this kind of example, we have this um, this this prosthetic fitting. It's a it's a pelvis model, and um, you know again, if we send this right to a printer, yeah, it, it might come out. But are our holes the right size? Is it are the holes the size that we intended them to be to fit into the parts that we intended them to fit to? So 
we have to add in this kind of smart information, this design intent to our model. So that way we can get something like this once, uh, this kind of zoom up of this bottom part. You know, we have our whole location. Sure, we have um, our, our teeth there, but they're not that well. Um, but, you know, now I can do is I can model it up with the actual smart dimensions to it, the actual sizes that we want. So that way when we send it to our printer, it is the proper size and it hasn't been computer assumptioned, um, added onto it or anything along those lines. This kind of uh, ties into the idea of surfacing as well. Um, so when we do surface fitting, um, especially in something like Design uh, Geometric Design X or in SolidWorks, um, we do get super accurate for surfaces to our mesh. Um, so in this case, I have this PlayStation 4 controller. I've taken the top card of the case and then turned it into a surface, and I've deleted all the way the sections that I don't want. This is kind of a different form of design intent. It's the idea that we're going to get rid of spots that we don't intend to actually manufacture. Um, or we don't want a part of our case itself. Um, and we're just left with this super accurate shell of it. Um, so again, I, I did something like an auto surface where I just basically did a one-to-one -one conversion of the mesh itself into a surface. I then added in features to kind of remove away the buttons and the, the things that I don't want. So I'm left with this only a super accurate shell of what I do want. As you can see with that bottom part, this is part of that prosthetic again, that if I were to send this right to the printer, you know, you can see we have our epoxy stains on there and we have little wears and tears and our holes aren't proper. Is it super accurate? Yes, it is super accurate. And then we can see from the deviation analysis that even all those epoxy marks are, are um, super accurate um, with that surface section. But again, we don't really want that. That's not what we intend to have. So we can use a form of hybrid modeling um, to kind of add in it solid inserts and then remove them away to create our ideal hole sizes. Um, and this is kind of a, a big point I want to drive home is that um, by adding in these intended designs and these features, we're adding um, the ability to edit them later on. So when it comes to actually rapid prototyping, so we make this phone case or this, this PlayStation controller and we send it to our printer or we thicken it and then send it to our printer and we find out that maybe a spot is not correct or there's like a little hiccup here and there. Well, I now have smart information added onto it, this intended um, cutaways where I can adjust the hole size if I want, or I can adjust the position if I want, remove it, and then send it right back to the printer. And in a matter of minutes, you know, we, we, we pull it off the printer, we can tell right away if it's not an issue, if there's an issue, make the adjustment right away. And actually, Jesse's gonna uh, point out a scenario that happened um, during a testing um, with a phone case. To kind of drive home another kind of point of the idea of design intent versus the original model, um, this is kind of a case where we had a clamp and um, this was welded together. You know, oftentimes these kind of clamps are welded together, and you know the flanges on these on this weld weren't you know exact right angles because you know people can do this. There's always a little hiccup for human error. And the gasket might not be at the right angle, but we can remake it with the proper fittings and angles. So this is a remade clamp, but you know, we might have a section that actually has to be accurate. Um, so in this case, that gasket was completely reverse engineered from the scan itself. So we have something super accurate um, to what the scan is, and we can just place that where we want, adding the intended idea, uh, position of that part. And because this is gonna be 3D printed, we're not really worried about the welding again. You know, we're not worried about it being in the improper position. We just need it to be the right size because our printer is going to print it in the proper position. And we can add our, our struts and so on and so on to that. And, you know, I, I, I you know, it, it sounds like it might be kind of straightforward a little bit and a little bit of um, engineering is in play. And you might be saying, well, why don't we just design it from the ground up? But a lot of times you have to know where those positions and fittings are to make your proper set, um, your, your proper uh, cutouts, as well as a situation like this gasket where you need to be a one-to-one. -one. So I wanted to just come over into DesignX. I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a demonstration of how we kind of, or at least how I approach the idea of design intent and when it comes to reverse engineering, because it's, again, something that you might not think about. It might seem like it's a little bit uh, straightforward, but it actually adds a little bit of um, in-depth to it. So I have you know, a block like this um, and it's already been imported in and I've done some kind of region groupings on it so I can select on faces, nothing too abnormal when it comes to design, uh, design X. Um, and I'm just gonna start off by adding in a sketch at the top. And why I'm doing this is because again, I could just convert this to a print and send it right away but maybe I do need to have some exact dimensions. I mean, I'm not really sure 100% what this um, distance might be for this block. So I'm gonna add in my own sketch lines and then add in my own dimensions, um, just so I can get a base. And then I'm gonna extrude this down. Just setting up 
the block itself. And so with this, now we can start actually adding in our inserted cuts. So again, kind of just going approaching the way of reverse engineering. Um, but you know, with something like this top section, we have a lot of holes and cutouts. So I want to make sure that these are all accurate for my print. So what I can do is I can go in, start a mesh sketch, and I'm going to essentially using the mesh sketch tool, which um, actually is going to use a cutting plane to intersect with my mesh. And then this intersect is going to actually create some outlines so I know where my positions are. It's really handy. Um, but again, what, what I really want from this is not the exact dimensions, but more of where are my positions that I'm going to be working with. Because again, we're going to add in the proper fittings afterwards, but we might not know where our hole positions are. You know, you could take out a caliper and take it onto the shop floor and measure what are the distance between these two bolts and then what are the position between these two rollers. Or I can 3D scan the object, bring it into my modeling software, and then I have everything I need to use as a reference right here, and I just have to add in the actual sizes that I want. So in this case, you know, I have a cutout of, I have my hole locations. I only have to click one button to add in a hole that fits to that center point. Now I can add in another hole for this position right here. I know they're in the right position. If I had my solid body, I can see that they line up pretty well. And at this point, I can now add in my dimensions. So 30.1, and then maybe this actually needs to be eight millimeters instead of 7.8 that it extracted. And at this point, we can start doing a circle or pattern on it. So making sure that it's in the proper position. There we go, patterning it at eight times. And here we now have it. We have our top part of our cut made, and it's with the proper sizing and dimensions that we want. So I can, again, I can now go through, extrude this down, and cut it away from my actual body, and I have a good base to work with. And you know, at this point, if let's say I send this off to the printer, you know, maybe we just needed to put this into our cut, and we send it to the printer, it comes back, and an engineer says, hey, you know, this hole might be not be in the right spot or we actually need to add a 10th hole or something like that. Well, I'm not out of luck. If I just sent it right to the printer, I wouldn't be able to make these changes. But because we've added design intent um, when we came to reverse engineering the model, I can go through and make those changes if needed. So again, I can, you know, an, another kind of situation is I have this, this sphere right here. Well, how about I go in and I'm gonna add in a solid body of a sphere, extract it from that region group, insert it in, and now I'm just gonna go through and delete it or sorry, a Boolean cut it away from my body. And here we go, another solid body with another cutaway feature. And then again, if an engineer comes back and says, hey, we have to make a design change. Well, again, no problem at all. I can edit my sketch, kind of lock it in place and change my diameter sizes and then send it right back out. And now we have something that's in the proper location, but it's something editable. So if we need to make these changes for a different design, well, we can do that right away. Um, you know, again, and, and this is different from designing it from the ground up because, again, we, we have our positions identified because of our scan itself. We know where we are in the right space. We're just adjusting the size of these for different designs. So I hope that kind of clarified a little bit more about why we kind of use design intent with scan data instead of just designing from the ground up. It's nice to have that reference to know where our locations are. So back into the the... PowerPoint, the, the second topic I wanted to kind of talk about when it comes to rapid prototyping is this idea that um, we can combine some scans together and work in a different approach to, to modeling. So you know, most of us are probably used to the traditional ground up, you know, prismatic modeling and something like SOLIDWORKS and machine design, but we're finding that we can actually start really modeling with mesh data itself. Um, we can use it also for references. So in a scenario like this um, Nerf gun I have on the bottom, I have a couple of different scans that I've combined together to see how they interact with one another. And maybe I need to replace one of those, you know, the, the scope on this Nerf gun is gonna be replaced with something else. Well, I can just swap it with a different scan and see how it would look before we'd send it to something like a printer. Um, if we are printing it or if we have like a, a machine assembly, we can see how something else would look to on it before we actually start manufacturing and make sure our clearances are right. Kind of a similar situation happens uh, and actually a lot with in the medical and toy industry and we have uh, this these these two scans on the on the right um, one is a scan of myself and i put my head onto a statue um, a historic statue and you know uh, another kind of scan of jesse um, being put onto a chess piece and you know yeah we can send this to the printer but let's say we want to make a whole board of chess pieces well, instead of having to go through and kind of do all these different commands to combine, you know, and, and remodeling and cutting these solid bodies off and going that way, I can just delete the scan of Jesse, 
and replace it with a scan of somebody else and then merge them together. And then we can send that right to our printer. So again, the ability to just quickly scan something, add it into a design, see how it looks, and if it looks good, and it's kind of a person design, and the base has already been modeled up right, well, we can just send it right to the printer and get that next version or iteration out um, and start to, to experiment around with that design. We see this a lot, this exact kind of situation a lot in the medical and casting industry. And the reason why is because something like a hand is gonna be extremely tough to model around, and we, you know, Maybe you have to, you know, doctors have to make a ton of different fittings and casts for, for different patients or you working on a shop floor and you have to make a ton of different um, safety, safety castings for your different tools. Well, you know, we could individually one by one manufacture these or we can just take the scan and bring it into something like Geomagic Freeform, which is a sculpting based off modeler. So different approach to modeling. We just talked about modeling based on replacing scans and meshes. Well, how about modeling based off of sculpting techniques? Um, and this is how we add our human factors into it, uh, into our design and our, our kind of like uh, specialty areas for different toolings or freeform shapes. So in our case with this hand for rapid prototyping, we can scan somebody's hand, bring it into freeform, model a uh, cast around it super quick. In this case, I just did a mask to cover the section that I want and then offset that. And if I need to make a fitting for a different hand, well, I just have to replace what hand is being used as a reference. I can scan a different hand, put it in there, and then now our fitting is going to fit to this different hand versus another one. Or in our case with the, with the you know, some kind of machine um, coat, um, we can scan our pipes and so on, put it into something like Freeform, model around it, and if let's say we have a different section of the pipe that we need to model, well, we can just remove the section that we imported in, put in a different one, and then remove it from our casting and kind of smooth out the sections, um, adding in that little extra fine little detail. Um, so we're seeing, you know, so this is a situation with medical and casting, and, you know, this is also done in product development, um, you know, this free, this freeform modeling approach. And the reason why is because a lot of times, especially again, when it comes to casting in cases, you really just need to make an offset of something and then kind of just go from there. You're going to do some erasing, you're going to do some fine tuning to the ca to the cast itself, um, maybe adding a unique design, especially with product development. Uh, and then a lot of the workflow is a little bit the same, but again, it's just a different approach to this rapid prototyping. Um, so in our phone case, kind of the same deal. I've brought in my phone into Freeform. I've done an offset command and then did some Boolean cuts and smoothing out to make the bottom part of the phone case. And then at that point, I can add whatever I want afterwards. So I have this phone case as a base from you know a Galaxy S9. If I get a Galaxy S8 handed to me, I can you know make the phone case really quick that way. And then I have the shell that I can now start sketching different parts onto. An engineer comes in and um, says, hey, we're going to be designing this around maybe some kind of fitting for a car. Well, I just have to now just mask the section I want, offset it, and then we go. We have that fitting for the car, uh, or um, you know, or or something else for for a different product. Um, so I'm talking about how to kind of approach this. We'll have a, a little demonstration of that as well because it's kind of too good to be true. I feel like a lot of people would say. Um, so I have Freeform open right now, and I'm actually going to change the camera down just a little bit so you can see the haptic device I'm using. Let's see here webcam needs to sit still. And this is what uh, essentially is used within Freeform. It's a haptic device that um, allows me to kind of move around my mouse and it affects what's in the workspace. Again, this different approach to modeling regarding sculpting. So I can go in and I can go into file and import in my model of my phone. So here I am importing in my phone itself. And my haptic device kind of snapped into place saying, hey, we recognize the model's now in the workspace. And um, uh, it comes in a little bit rough. And I wanted to show that we can take something that is a little bit rough at first and kind of work it and massage it in a way to make it a little bit better. So at first, I'm going to add it in. I'm going to say I want to import it in this mesh in as clay. So we have a person, a, a scan of a person. I've done this plenty of times to be able to clean up a person's scan before we printed it. Um, and then we can add our little detail. So how much detail do we want in this? If everything looks good, I can just click apply and it's going to place that model now in the workspace. There we go. I can move it around if I want to change the position, but overall it's looking pretty good. And now at this point, I can go over and if I want to make it a little bit more smooth, because again, this was intended to be a little bit of a rough scan. Some, sometimes you might not have the best scanner. Um, and then I can go through and say, you know what, let's select all, and I'm just going to add a smoothness to it. And it's smart about the way that it smooths this. It says, okay, well, let's 
individually smooth everything that's being selected. And um, if I wanted to maybe instead just smooth the individual section, as you can see, I'm kind of pushing on the clay and my haptic device is sitting still. You can kind of highlight an individual area and then, you know, this little uh, sticker location, I can just say defeature that. It's going to go through and remove it. So another way of smoothing this out. And, you know, I want this kind of smooth case because when I do my offset, I want to make sure that it comes out very smooth as well. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go over into my pieces, create an offset piece and say two millimeters. And why I like design or, or geometric freeform um, for this kind of sculpting based modeling practice, a different approach, is because you can combine both sculpting techniques with prismatic modeling. So it's not like something where it's you know a purely sculpting device where I'm kind of going through and sculpting uh, individual sections. I can actually add and say, no, I want this to be a very precise amount of difference. I want this to be two millimeter offset instead of just an assumption of an offset. Um, and another kind of cool thing about this is the ability to quickly clean up sections based on projection in. So I have this phone uh, case right now. My next thing I have to do is I'm gonna have to um, remove a Boolean cut. So I'm cutting away that smaller piece from this new offset. And the reason why I want this to now be hollow on the inside. So you're not seeing any difference, but we're gonna see it in a moment. And if I turn my part into a different angle, again, I'm gonna now do this thing where it's essentially projecting a grid onto the mesh. I'm gonna create a plane. I want it to be normal to my face. And then I'm actually just gonna sketch on this plane that I just inserted. So now instead of my haptic device pressing to the clay, it's pressing to that, that, that plane I projected. I'm just gonna draw a line maybe like from right here to something like right here. Just kind of shaving off the top part of this. Um, and um, what I'm also gonna do is, cause I'm gonna use an extrusion, I need this to be a solid body. So I'm just adding in some extra spots above to remove my material. And here I am now using hybrid tools. So I'm gonna create a, um, an extrusion of this sketch. And move it back a bit. There we go. And then I have a couple of different ways to add or remove. So I'm just gonna choose remove this. Well, it looks like I could actually adjust this a little bit further. As you can see, maybe my first line wasn't the best. So I can go in and um, select on, oops, not the extrude. I wanna be able to move my sketch entities on this. There we go. So I'm just bringing this down just a little bit more. I'm gonna just fix up my edges. Add an extra little sketch line. And I'm just gonna re-extrude this feature. So again, being able to just on the fly make changes um, to this kind of sculpting method and you know, kind of apply it to that form of rapid prototyping. You know, In this scenario, the part might be off. Well, that's no problem. We have smart information to it. We can adjust that on the fly pretty quick and easy. Um, and at this point, I can go and I go in a little bit further and smooth this out some more, kind of cleaning up the edges if I want. Um, and I can hide my plane so I don't see it in the way anymore. And we have the base of our phone down. Um, and, you know, again, now at this point, if we want to replace what phone is being used, well, we can replace it and our commands will offset it. And I can kind of go in and, and sculpt away the parts that I don't need. So if maybe we want to add some kind of unique design to this. Well, I can now go in and sketch it away. I can add a precise amount of measurement and change my hardness for my clay. And I can go in and, as you can see, kind of erasing away parts where my button locations would be, or I can use that sketching method to add that in. Something really cool about um, Freeform that I also really like is the ability to sketch right on or make spline lines right on our part for that idea of kind of adding the uniqueness and human humanness to our products or different designs. Um, so I can do something like a draw curve. And actually this is pretty handy when it comes in the medical industry. If you scan like a body part and you need to draw a curve on the object um, to get an outline, that's pretty useful. Um, or in machine to combine different things together and make a, a smooth transition between different things. But for our phone case, I'm just gonna go through, kind of make you know that kind of swirly pattern that I showed a moment ago. 
because it's pretty pretty cool to just throw a run on there. We got the sketch line. If I need to adjust it later on, I definitely can. But I can now use these sketch tools to add in different details. So in this case, I can use this 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 straight pattern. I'm gonna just add in maybe some kind of thickness to it, or if I want to add a precise amount, I'm going to my measurements and adjust it right there. Because again, this is um, smart about the way it approaches. Maybe I can increase this thickness so I can make sure it kind of goes on the the very bottom. And just rotate rotate this around. Yep, it goes all the way through. And again, just doing this removal. And here we go. We have a different phone case design. So you know, at this point, I can send this again right off to the printer. I just have to right click and then export this out as a mesh. But let's say an engineer comes in and they say, Matt, you know, swirly patterns are not in right now. We need diamond patterns. Well, that's no problem. I can just undo my command or just make this phone case as a base, open up in a new project, and then I can go in and add in my own pattern afterwards. Again, kind of just really quickly being able to add in human factors, clean up things if needed, add in smooth transitions, just developing new ways of rapid prototyping and making designs on the fly. So I want to bring it back to the idea, uh, back to the printing side of things and um, things that we worry about when it comes to prints versus um, actual designs or manufacturing. When it comes to printing, you know, we're worried about other things. We're worried about layers. We're worried about how is our design actually laid out to actually get the proper fillets and chamfers. We're also worried about the part geometry. Just can we actually fit in our filament into the object itself? Another thing we're also kind of worried about when it comes to rapid prototyping is material cost. If we're going to be making a bunch of versions, how do we optimize that? As well as um, the maximum parts that we can fit into a bed. Oh, yep. Um, you know, so so these are kind of different factors that uh, of things that we worry about, as well as maybe something like a cosmetic change um, too. So instead of the manufacturing process, where we're worried about, okay, how do we actually get our tool into here? We're worried about how do we actually make sure things line up with one another, and how do we optimize this to the best of our ability? Well, this is something that printer settings and even different printers can fix up with. And um, at this point, you know, I want to hand it over to Jesse. He's going to talk a lot more about this side. We don't have any further questions. Um, and Jesse can kind of go in depth about that printing aspect of it. Hey, Matt, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Like Matt mentioned, my name is Jesse. And again, I'll be spending a little bit of time today uh, elaborating on how 3D printing can be used in the context of rapid prototyping. So I'll, I'll start it off just by showing this cool chart that shows a lot of the 3D printing technologies and companies that are that are out there. Uh, 3D printing has been around since the 80s and there's a lot of different methods to print things. Part of any manufacturing process is kind of choosing the correct tool or technology for the job and there really is no one-stop shop for every single possible part or geometry. Uh, so we definitely won't be going over every single method, uh, but instead we'll be taking a quick look at MarkForge and HP, which Hawkridge works with. Uh, now both of these technologies can deliver and use parts, but they do so in different ways. So we'll quickly cover that first. So first we'll go over MarkForge a bit, who have systems that can print plastics and composites, and they even have a metal printer itself called the Metal X. The entire point of these machines is printing strong and use parts uh, for either prototyping or low volume production. Uh, all of their printers fall under the same material extrusion categories that was uh, highlighted on the last slide, which means that they form parts layer by layer until geometry is finished. Uh, so here's a bit of an exaggerated example of what that might look like. The finished part on the right is definitely made up of more than 15 layers, but the idea is that the MarkForge software will uh, form your part into slices, uh, with each slice being parallel to the print bed. Uh, every slice builds on the previous slice before it uh, gets your part off the bed. All the current MarkForge printers will work under this same basic principle. So we see a lot of easy transitions with users who go from composites to metal uh, and the other way around as well. Now on the composite side, they work with a process called continuous fiber fabrication, which basically means that they inlay continuous strands of fiber into a layer of the part. Uh, this par uh, picture has a Kevlar weave in the layer that this part was stopped at. Uh, fiber works best while in tension, which means that conformal loads are really great. In the context of scanning, kind of like Matt mentioned, this means that taking scan data and making non-bumpy holes or flat faces can even help to improve part performance with these composite systems. Now, one of the main things to look for when we are working with material extrusion printers is going to be geometries that can cause overhangs. 
on the left hand side is a quick example of layers in the middle of a part that form an overhang, meaning that they'll need to be supported by some sort of support structure since they couldn't just print over nothing. So if your part has a lot of overhangs, this adds more material to the print, which uh, could mean a little or a lot more print time. So instead of direct overhangs, a good solution is fillets or slanted features like on the right. Uh, any fillet that is 45 degrees from vertical or less should have self-supporting layers, meaning no supports. So here's an example of what something like that could look like. One sort of uh, theoretical question to think about when working with these types of systems is why is that hole round? And a lot of times it's just because the tools we use uh, in a traditional manufacturing process make them round. So on the left example, we have a part with a ton of arcs and holes, meaning that the top layers of each of these needs to be supported because of the overhanging layers. If we change these to something like a teardrop or a diamond shape, uh, these layers become self-supporting and remove the supports, which in this particular example uh, cuts material use by 29% between revisions, which is quite a lot. Now, that's not to say that this is a solution for every single hole or feature, as a, a lot of things do need to be round for one reason or another. But this goes back to into design intent. If you know you're going to print a file, you can easily take a few steps in CAD to make it uh, easier and better to print. So uh, like I said earlier, MarkForge is really, really great for strong, low volume production runs. Their composite systems uh, can be stronger than aluminum with carbon fiber inside of them. So in a lot of cases, we see those parts uh, just straight up replace uh, things like work holdings, toolings, jigs, uh, stuff like that. Uh, but if we go to the example of the pelvis that Matt showed earlier, what about uh, something with a really, really large volume uh, or a lot of organic overhanging shapes? Uh, that's where we'll lead into the HP systems, which are production powder bed machines that can still produce end-use parts, uh, but with the goal of making a lot of them. They also have a ton of material options, uh, like a different top, a lot of size of nylon uh, to some flexible TPU and even a full color machine. So just like Mark Forge, we'll quickly go over how the uh, HP system machines work. Uh, again, these are powder-based machines, and similar to the material extrusion systems, they do slice parts into small uh, layer cross sections. Uh, the HP systems will spread a thin layer of powder uh, and then use print heads to deposit fusing agents into the areas of that layer uh, where geometry is. You can see that the fusing agents are where the black areas are in the bed of powder. Uh, you then have uh, a ton of fusing lamps that will fuse these layers together, uh, creating that particular layer of geometry. The process then, uh, like just uh, the previous printers, repeats itself until the build is done, and afterwards you unpack your parts and remove them from the powder, and then you have your parts. So again, going back to that pelvis model that we're using as an example, we decided to print that one on uh, one of our HP uh, MJF 5200 systems, and it came out fantastic. My colleague, Austin, on the right, uh, got to unpack this build. Again, HP systems do a really good job at producing extremely complex geometry uh, with really, really good detail. Now, when we work with uh, the HP printers, one thing to keep in mind is that the build area is three-dimensional in the sense that parts can be stacked above, below, or beside any other part. The other really cool thing about these machines is that when they're printing, the print head uh, will always move at the same speed for every single layer when it is depositing fusing agents, uh, regardless of how much geometry is in that layer. So the only thing that we really need to be concerned with uh, that impacts our print time is going to be how uh, tall in the build area the geometry reaches. So uh, as a kind of a short uh, extreme example, we have a really small pillar that is 370 millimeters tall on the left and has, uh, and on the right we have a build of almost 130 of the scanned phone cases we looked at in a previous webinar on the right. Uh, the height of the phone case build is also 370 millimeters, which means that there will be uh, the same number of layers uh, as the parts on the right and the left, uh, same uh, print length for both builds as well. HP systems can reuse powder, so the powder volume on the left isn't exactly wasted, but there is so much more throughput, obviously, on the right-hand side. Now, going back into the design intent for these machines, one important fact is that because uh, this is a powder-based machine, the printer will assume uh, part internals are solid unless otherwise specified on the software side. Uh, this can be a good thing, but if weight is a concern for you, the fact that parts will support themselves in a build opens up the door to all kinds of cool options for things like custom lattice structures. Uh, obviously, parts can also be hollowed or shelled with some ribs to add reinforcement to uh, specific areas. It all comes down to kind of what you're looking for with the part.
So what does any of that really mean for prototyping? Essentially, it opens up the door for iterations before moving to the manufacturing step. So uh, I have a little bit of a workflow here, and obviously this is not going to be the case for everyone or every project, but it's common to uh, involve outsourcing to a design shop, having to wait through their queues because of things like volumes, and then waiting for the parts to get delivered after they're built. If something ends up needing to be changed on the CAD size, once you get that part in hand, the process uh, of this can start all over again. Uh, internally, 3D printing a part removes a lot of that hassle, letting designers update their parts after getting them in hand. Once iterations are made, it can more quickly move into production, which reduces time to market. Sometimes the production even goes back to the 3D printing side. Uh, and even if all you're doing is freeing up some of your machinist time by moving some projects to a printer, you can gain uh, gain a lot. So what are some of the ways that you can take advantage of uh, those time savings? Well, uh, the most obvious one is going to be design changes, right? In a webinar earlier this month, we went over this phone case here and how our initial prototype had fillets that didn't easily allow for the phone case to fit inside. Uh, with that knowledge, Matt was able to go back into the CAD and make two different iterations for us to print and test before moving them over to a colored version on an HP printer. Uh, this is a small example, but uh, fill it holding up a project because you had to wait for another outsource build can be pretty painful. Uh, the next example of using these processes to your advantage is going to be unit tests, which is basically just printing a small section of a whole part to test something. So Matt touched on earlier how scans will pick up surface discrepancies and how printers will and can create that geometry. And maybe that's what you want for a printer to print a scanned texture. Uh, as in the example of the pelvis, we wanted to see how the scan surface quality would be. So instead of printing the entire thing, we just cut out a small section on the top circular area uh, and printed it. This shows us how the pock marks and the surface texture would look without, uh, again, us needing to print the whole thing and, and waste material and time. Uh, this one is great for also testing uh, fit uh, tolerances of interfacing geometry instead of, again, printing the whole thing multiple times when only one small thing needs to be tested. Uh, the next thing that you can do is potentially reduce the amount of components used in an assembly. So here we have a Stanley Black & Decker actuator housing that goes on a post driver with the original uh, version on the left and a Metal X printed version on the right. Uh, this was originally, uh, like it shows here on the left uh, and the right, makes uh, made of four pieces, which goes down to one printed piece on the Metal X uh, that because of some internal channels and geometry couldn't be machined. Uh, contracts on the Stanley Black & Decker side also means that they were required to replace these components uh, on their uh, assemblies and devices for a certain amount of time. So instead of keeping a physical inventory to prevent having to pay for low volume runs over and over again, they instead convert all of their physical inventory into a digital one and then print them on demand. Uh, like everything else we've talked about, reducing components can, can also help save time to market. And this one sort of ties into the original design change point, but there is a, honestly a really big advantage to seeing and feeling a cosmetic change for a part before it moves into production. So I felt that this one kind of deserved its own slide. If we go back to the point Matt had about uh, custom fittings, uh, maybe a texture isn't comfortable uh, or useful enough for an end user. So that can go back to the CAD side and the texture can be changed. Uh, even if it's something as simple as seeing a logo on a part before it goes out the door and realizing that the color scheme doesn't look how you want it. Uh, I mentioned earlier how HP machines are great for really detailed parts, uh, and maybe you want to export a sim plot of some complicated geometry so that you can physically show someone uh, some of the results. It all, again, goes back to what your intent is uh, with the end product, uh, but there's a ton of ways that rapid prototyping can help improve it. So that's all I had on the 3D printing side of things. But with that, I will turn it back over to Matt. Thank you, Jesse. Um... Yeah, so thank you so much for going over more of the printing side of it. Um, and I kind of wanted to just uh, drive home a little bit more about the idea that, you know, with with the idea of rapid prototyping, especially with additive manufacturing, kind of like a closing mark, is that, you know, we're used to the very machining aspect of it. And as you saw for something like that Stanley Decker part, you know, the part that we 3D printed had those kind of diamond shapes onto it not the circular shapes and it was a single part versus multiple parts and as you said they digitally inventory the parts so they can print it on the fly so you know when don't think of rapid prototyping when it comes to scanning data as okay just scanning a part and being able to get an output super quick and machining around it it's 
you're keeping this information for the future. You're keeping it so if you have to make any design changes later on, if you have to make any part changes or remake a part later on, you have both the digital version of it, so you can use references for exact locations, and you have these tools with the 3D printer to maximize the amount of stuff you can print and reduce the cost time of manufacturing it. Again, kind of like that phone case where I was able to scan my phone and now I had a 3D version of the phone and you know a matter of minutes and I can use this for so many different design approaches and we originally talked about using it in SolidWorks and then I just kind of showed it a little bit inside of Freeform. But you know we're able to get that scan to a manufactured part and then to a print and then in the same day, we can figure out if we actually did need to make that fillet change. And because it's been designed with smart intention and design intent, I can make that fillet change right on the fly. So I just want to kind of drive home that point a little bit more since it's kind of an important topic and really what I'd like to talk about the most about with uh, this webinar. You know, our contact information is up there. Um, we, you know, just kind of touched on a little bit of topics. The idea is to kind of spark some conversation with your colleagues. Just, hey, did you know that we can do this kind of deal? And this is kind of being used now. Um, so you are more than welcome to reach out to any of us um, for any additional questions that you might have. If you want some live demos, um, you are more than welcome to reach out as well. And we can kind of show you. And um, even with printing, we can do test prints for you guys as well. Um, we are more than happy to accommodate anything you guys might need. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to close the webinar, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day.